Hello and most welcome to 1941 of the H series. We will today continue with Wittgenstein and the dualism of the inner and the outer by Hauptung. Last time we started to look even closer into the specific helpful clues or helpful tools we are given by our time to understand things in Wittgenstein, I would say, eludes even the sharpest minds. These are most definitely things so complex, so hard to understand and above all, I'd say subtle. So they elude understanding. And the last finishing words, organic whole, I think is important here. Because when we start, um, start to understand that a dualism is rather not a dualism, it's an interwovenness. An interwovenness that is so closely knit in together and conjured. So that horrible cleft between inner and outer mind and soul shines away as an illusion, dissipates like a morning fog when the sun comes round it slowly dissipates and leave leaves clearness understanding knowledge and this is an organic whole i'd say is connected to the right hemisphere and also i would say to Stephen M. Rosen's a whole that creates wholeness. is showing how worlds are not something transcendental from another planet is used by inferring grafting in horticulture. I think it's just marvelous. I show these depictions to several people and they say, now we understand how it could be possible that words are of the senses, from the primitive or the <laughs> proto-phenomena, but still entirely different. It can be both. But until we're given some sort of help for the mind to understand how it can be both, we are left struggling. And I would say that that is a torturous struggle. It's not a nice one. Instead, we can enter wholeness. A grafting creates wholeness in the understanding. And I'd say also holiness, reverence for something holy, something more delicate, specific, and beautiful. All these traits are to be found here. And I'll continue. We are now at the second paragraph at page 90. Just where I ended with as an organic whole. Yet we are apt to forget this organic unity, especially in philosophy. In philosophy. 
<laughs> the reasons for this are complex, but we can identify at least two main reasons. Reasons. These are at the same time also results of the double growth mentioned above. One result is more specific, the other more general. 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 <laughs> The more specific result is that our natural or nya natural expressions of sensation, for instance, the primitive cry of pain and ouch, become as it were submerged by a sea of language or crowded out by words as figure seven makes vivid. These words are initially used by the child predominantly expressively. Expressively. But as he grows older, they are used increasingly intellectually by him, by him, by him. By the time he has acquired a full fledged language and so an intellect. His use of language is predominantly intellectual. Intellectual. Of course, the expressive use is never entirely, entirely lost, but it becomes recessive and occasional. Occasional, occasional. <laughs> Thus, in the language use, as in other regions of civilized human life, the natural primitive becomes atrophied relative to the intellectual. To the intellectual.
This is why the expressive use of language that is exemplified by the a unities, which is close to the natural primitive and far from the intellectual, is difficult to recall in mind. And why, and listen now, why the natural primitive unities, even when recalled, seem thin and incidental? Indeed, this expressive Use is so recessive that it has no name, and I have to, I have had to make it do with a subscript. Why, indeed. It is no incident that our insight into these natural primitive unities is fragile. Fragile, fragile, fragile. The general and main result of the double growth is that the connection between sensation and its expression becomes less direct and more complicated. This retrieves a piece of common sense we grown-ups are more complicated than little, little children. Little children, indeed. Or in other words, the distance between the inner domain of sensations and the outer domain of sensation expressions becomes increasingly large. And the general distinction between these two domains becomes increasingly entrenched, entrenched, entrenched. It is in this way that language itself prepares the soil for the dualism of the inner and 
the outer for the existence of a deeply entrenched distinction is a basic precondition of dualism. This is not to say that this entrenchment inevitably leads to the dualism. No, the general division between the inner and the outer, however deeply entrenched, is itself in order. But it does form a permanent background that constantly encourage, encourages the dualism. This it what is what gives the diagnosis relevance and poignancy. 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 Indeed. <laughs> poignancy. <laughs> Seven, the critique of language. The dualism of the inner and the outer has, of course, other causes. In particular, it has causes that are operative in specifically philosophical modes of thought. Modes of thought. Indeed. <laughs> Thought. Thought. <laughs> but the entrenchment of a general distinction between the inner and the outer through the incision of language is its primary cause. Because the incision of language is just the learning of language under another aspect and this, the learning of language, is rooted in certain fundamental facts of ordinary life. Life. 
Oh, Brian. <laughs> These roots are much more massive and run much deeper than any roots in specifically philosophical moods of life. Life. That the dualism of the inner and the outer has its deepest roots via the incision or learning of language. in ordinary human life itself may generate, at least in some readers, a deep sense of ambivalence about the learning of a language. And so about the acquisition of an intellect of an intellect of an intellect it may be instructive to heighten this sense of ambivalence a little a little Huh. A little, <laughs> a little goes a long way, <laughs> or only a half could do. We can gain a heightened sense of ambivalence here, ambivalence here, if only in a surface scratching manner. By appreciating the power and legitimacy of the forces driving the incision of language, language. Consider again the child learning a sensation language described in 244. The adults around him play a crucial role in this learning because it is they who teach the language to him. To him. To him. In doing so, they drive the language like a scion in grafting between his pain inner 
and pain expression outer. That is, they drive the incision of language. Of language. Consider again the child learning a sensation language, sorry. What forces drive this incision? Incision. Incision. What is the incision? The cut, the cleft, the entrenchment to the trenches. To begin with, the adults at issue here, typically the parent, but especially the mother, have a powerful natural desire to know about the child. In particular, to know how it is with him in his interior interior <laughs> this desire is very powerful because it is a manifestation of an elemental instinct in us namely the instinct to Care. To care. This desire is on vivid display when, for instance, the mother, upon hearing her child burst into cries of pain, rushes to him and anxiously asks, what is it? Where does it hurt? How did you get hurt? And similar questions. 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 How did you get hurt? <laughs> <laughs> So this will be a short one, so we'll end here. Time for discussion, although it has already gotten quite interesting. The last one is similar question, and the count is now 1941. The venomous attack on your country, Kale, by the Russians in 1941. So, becoming really interesting here, although we read quite shortly, quite short. Go to page 90. And a bit down on the third paragraph, the third paragraph. <laughs> uh, begins with uh, the last sentence of the third paragraph. This is why the expressive use of language that is exemplified by A units 
unities, which is close to the natural primitive and far from the intellectual, is difficult to recall to mind and why the natural primitive unities, even when recalled, seem thin and incidental. They are very hard to find. We need to dig etymologically within ourselves. They are so thin, these proto-phenomena. Well, we need to reach them within ourselves to understand that even worse, the intellectual share an origin. But it's fragile, it's subtle. When we grow old, adult, we become coarse. Children are much softer, much subtler, careful, caring. We as adults are actually living out the clefts, the entrenchments and the divisions. This harshness of the adult is the violence of forgetting what everything originated in. Where it all came from. The last sentence I really like, it's well weighted by how time. It is no accident that our insight into these natural primitive unities is fragile. I would say extensively fragile. I, I can tell, confess myself, Sunday, maybe it's a confessional day, but <laughs> I've been doing analytical philosophy for many years. And do, man, that is harsh. It is constantly working on divisions, dichotomies, and it's aggressive. I even saw once a fr literally a frying pan being thrown at the person at the philosophical institution. It's harsh, aggressive, it's not cooperative, it's anything but childlike. It's the harshness, the unforgiving heart, stiff-neckedness, if you want to go to the Bible, we have become stiff-necked. Suspicious, uncaring, rejecting, rejective. This can be loosened up, and how Tang gives an example further down. I'll come to that a bit below. But the penultimate or the third last sentence here, it's a very good description. Where is the entrenchment? It's steeply buried. This is what we call the division between mind and soul, by its, between the sensuous and the intellectual. There is no frontier, but instead the connection, which is so vital, life-giving to both of them, is buried and almost disconnected. I say almost, not completely. It's like when a stiff-necked neck, stiff -necked person talks, the voice becomes strangled, becomes harsh, demanding. It loses its laughter, its easiness. It loses its heart. Darida called it the detoned voice. And I like this last one. No, the general division between the inner and the outer, however deeply entrenched, is itself in order. But it does form, continuing on next page, a permanent background that constantly encourages the dualism. This is what gives the diagnosis 
relevance and poignancy. Poignancy! It is when it's almost cut off, deeply embedded and hidden away. Even if it's just, I'd say, I don't completely agree, but it makes that we lose a lot of that energy, that vividness that we had as children. And I think deep in heart, I think we traded that vividness, that blood in everything for the intellectual life as adults. And everything became black and white and discolored and <laughs> less enjoyable. Wittgenstein shows a way out of this. He shows a way to the subtle, happy, childlike spiritual life. We go deeper down into the subchapter, the critique of language. is to talk about the philosophical modes of thought. In particular, the second sentence, it has causes that are operative in specifically philosophical modes of thought. But the entrenchment of a general distinction between the inner and the outer through the incision of language is its primary course because the incision of language is just the learning of language under another aspect and this the learning of language is rooted in a certain fundamental facts of ordinary life These roots are much more massive and run much deeper than any roots in the specifically philosophical moods of life. And I mentioned Chandra uh, a couple of lectures uh, ago. Now the intuitions of Chandra, these subtle ones, because I think he'd been working with subtle intuitions about the universe. And that subtlety had not been put to good work into uh, when it comes to the classical mode of understanding these things, classical physics, which is coarser, harder, more dividing, not as encompassing and lovingly, like a traumatized child. I <laughs> mean, that is actually quite apt. It's like a traumatized child. You get traumatized by classical physics. These sharp divisions. However, they are apt in some aspects, but they go too deep. They make for chiasms, clefts, unbearable. This is the reason I'd say, and Edward de Bono agrees, with that point, and also in McKilchrist, why we've seen so much violence in the modern age. This cut cuts through everything, and we can only understand the world when the cut is so deep by using oppositions, dichotomies, and they will lead to war in the end, an understanding of the world in black and white. Sharp divisions. And as we know, the world today sees many tragic wars. A lot of tragedy, especially the last year. 
Wittgenstein was a peaceful man and he was the only spiritual philosopher during the last century of this depth. And he shows us how that subtlety, how that subtleness disappears and how it can be retaken. How we once more can become open-minded and have both intellect and senses thinking. That's not half bad. <laughs> Carlo is coming in. Carlo, media. Thank you, Hans. Let me go to this image here. With the crafting figure five on 80, page 88. Uh, so, <clears throat> tongue focuses on, focuses on the cut. And that is actually very Deridian. And Derrida once said that the cut, that's all I have spoken about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, indeed. And, um, in the, and if you want to read Derrida biographically, you could say that he always speaks about his own circumcision. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It, <laughs> no, I remember, yeah. <laughs> um, but then it would be then you would fall into the trap of the original. Where is the original wound, so to say? Mm -hmm. It's tricky. Um, you could say instead perhaps that the cut in Derrida's life, it was continuous. It was mm -hmm. revealed during World War II when he was expulsed from the school, etc., etc. So there were many cuts, mm -hmm. or to use a word uh, that you like, iteration of cuts in Derrida's yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, it's an iteration of cuts, definitely. Very good. Yeah, I like that. But let's, uh, the issue is tricky, and we spoke about this last time, but I think it's good to return to this figure one. No, it was, I went too far in figure one. Uh, figure one, it was here. About, this is Tang's theory, about the original pain here in a dot, mm. and it results in a crying. Mm. And I, I spoke about it. Uh, I was against this image because mm. I don't think Wittgenstein would agree because it no, was supposed to be an original. I, 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 I checked it out a bit, Carla, and I don't think he would agree. I think it's just about uh, there should be another arrow there somehow. Mm. Um, hmm. And we could also think about the uh, wave and uh, particle duality. So it's uh, so in the way it's, it, it em encompasses many things. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, for instance, in psychology, um, they make the uh, mistake of focusing on this small dot here, the particle, so to say. Oh yeah. Particle pain. <laughs> and then, uh, so they, for, they try to go too deep inside the human being and to find the reason for this pain inside you but then they make the mistake of forget it outside surroundings yes and we don't know we, don't we for instance from uh, chaos theory the butterfly so even very 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 small changes in surroundings can have a huge uh, impact indeed and uh, the butterfly effect is almost like uh, uh, dissolving the idea of an origin and i was also thinking what how time wrote here about uh, the the mother who asked the child uh, out of care but misleads the child by asking where does it hurt and how does it hurt and in the end uh, uh, the child learns that the pain is the original but we know with children, if they fall and they look, that they really hurt themselves and you don't say anything or you start talking about something else, mm. they, they won't be that much fuss. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does our Miriam want to say something? Mm, please come mm. in, Miriam. there for me. Hello, Miriam. How are you? <laughs> Thank Good you. evening. Good evening. You know, you are uh, 
prata fenomen fenomenen då vill ju pronans inte så svitt. And I want to tell you Hans that you uh, really killed it tonight because and then I understand why you were gone because you were compensated and I want to just thank you. I will not comment now. Okay, Everything. fair enough. <laughs> Next time then. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good to hear from you. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I, I, I do like figure seven. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Kalle, but figure seven there is quite nice as well. Oh, yes, maybe this is up here. <clears throat> I need to see that. Seven, 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 seven. <clears throat> yes, uh, three, four, five, six, and seven. <clears throat> yeah. Here, we still have these uh, darned arrows that you mentioned before, Callan, I, I do see you. But he, here you see uh, how things are going back to the pain. Hmm. They go from the arrow to the original dot there and changes the dot and uh, they question the origin, so to speak. It's a bit deconstructivist, hmm. complex web of things and children they have a very hard time to actually tell where it, where it hurts and i think there's good reason for that mm. the good reason is it doesn't hurt in a specific point until you get the language for that and then the pain can, can come from a specific point mm. Mm. Uh, i remember from linguistic the some languages pain is never spoken about something that is inside the body it's always outside the body. Mm. So they, they would say something, oh, uh, a bit atop of my skin is hurting, or I have a terrific pain in, in my head cap. <laughs> mm. 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 So it's depending uh, sort of the life world and what sort of uh, word game you are playing, or uh, language game, sorry, language game. Mm. Hmm. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure thing, of course. Maybe it's touching a little bit more in the psychology, uh, because this externalization of pain mm. is part maybe of survivalist trait of these alloplastic defenses, when the things that are not pleasant, you always attribute it outside of yourself, or outside oh, yeah, of your yeah, body. Yeah. Uh, do you think it could be... It could be like uh, naturally attributed to us, or survive. also these alloplastic defenses part of the uh, survivalist trait. Yeah, you sure. Think that we learn it, we inherit it. Yeah, definitely. It's probably those features as well. I, I do bet. I do bet. And looking at different languages, you see how widely different uh, those things are. And I also, I, I sort of remember not being able to tell exactly where pain was. It was more like I was just having the pain. I think I had uh, whatever that's called in English, Kalokal's fever, and it was painful. I had no idea where. But nowadays, I always know where the pain is. <laughs> Maybe in alloplastic survival mode. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I like it. Cheers. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I saw uh, you could also think about uh, where is the image with the crafting here, like the Derrida and Cut. So, uh, like in psychology, let's say that you have a trauma in your childhood, and the psychologist uh, wants to uh, <clears throat> get the, uh, find out who is the criminal. Is there a criminal? Let's say there was a rape in your childhood, something mm, like that. Mm. And let's uh, compare this with the Derrida and uh, circumcision which is of course a legal um, thing but there you could ask is is the person who is doing the circumcision is he so to say kind of perpetrator no he is only doing it's in unison with the, the whole community oh yeah the jewish law 
Mm. Uh, so is uh, so this shows that is you cannot only point a finger to one perpetrator. 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 <laughs> yes. So it's it's a um, community, a law, mm. uh, the whole uh, society. So and I think that so, so, uh, psychology forgets that. Mm. Um, of course, you can in that uh, say that say there is a crime and. Um, uh, you want only to put the perpetrator in the, in the perpetrator. Perpe, perpe, perpetrator. perpetrator perpetrator in the prison. That's one thing. Um, hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but, but, but uh, it's not so easy as the, in this case it would be because he didn't blame the one who holds the knife in his hand. No, 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 no. Of course. For the bris, for the Jewish bris, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I forgot a little bit about Derrida there. Well, thank you for bringing it up again, Kalle. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid I have to Let's put stop it <clears throat> down now for um, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for participating. It was great fun, as usual. Mm. Do keep laughing. <laughs> it helps everything. Have a very mm. beautiful night. Thank you, and good morning, goodbye, good night, wherever you are. And I stop here. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice Thanks. night. Bye.